Hey everybody, Jason Cooper here with another edition of Funded Friday. Uh, I am very lucky to be joined by Ted Als uh, Alsbach, who is the creator of a number of projects on Kickstarter, but currently he is funding a project called One Night Ultimate Vampire, which is, as of recording this, uh, already at $136,000 against its $5,000 goal. It has another 25 days to go and has uh, a, around uh, 1,900 backers exactly at the moment. So uh, an unbridled success for sure. Ted, why don't you um, just quickly tell everybody a little bit about what this game is and um, how you came up with it. Sure. So uh, One Night Ultimate uh, Vampire, it's a prequel to a set of existing games. Uh, the, the existing games are One Night Ultimate Werewolf, and One Night Ultimate Werewolf is a, it's a, a version of Werewolf that takes place in just 10 minutes. Uh, it's got this great free audio app that kind of runs through all the different things that happen. Um, each player gets to be a werewolf or a, a villager, and uh, they do a couple things, and then there's discussion about who the werewolves are, and then they point. Uh, for Vampire, uh, Vampire, what that does is it lets people be vampires instead, but it adds some new mechanics that really kind of change up the game a little bit while keeping the core this whole social deduction thing going. And uh, people are really excited about it. Obviously, um, you know, it looks like we're going to uh, eclipse the previous Kickstarter that we did for the last, for the sequel to One Night. Uh, that was 150000 over 30 days, and it looks like we're probably going to get to 150000 within the next couple of days. It's, uh, it's really impressive, and uh, games have sort of carved out a, a strong niche on Kickstarter in general, and this is your eighth project. Uh, tell me about your first experience uh, with crowdfunding uh, a game on Kickstarter. Yeah, so um, actually the first thing I did on Kickstarter wasn't a game. It was actually, um, it was, uh, uh, I used to draw a comic strip for board games called Board to Pieces, and I did a compilation of them um, in book form, and I did that as a Kickstarter, and I, don't know, I raised like 10000 maybe. I don't know how much it was. It was very little, but at the time, it was significant because uh, you know it funded the production of the books, and that's really what I was going for. I was like, hey, wow, I've done this cartoon for a while. I'd love to get hard copies out there, and it was just enough to fund them, and then I, I sold some on our, our company website as well. As far as games go, um, I did a few other things after that. The one thing that I did um, was a game called Mutant Meeples. It was kind of a big box game. It was one of those things I wasn't sure if, uh, in at that time, if it was something that would actually sell. And so I put it up on Kickstarter. I had a pretty modest goal. I think it was 10000 or something. And then I got maybe 15000 um, as a result of that. And that was great. Uh, that worked well. The one thing I learned from that uh, I, you know, I did a whole bunch of fun stretch, or not stretch goals, but reward levels with people and really custom, let them customize things in the game and, and elsewhere. And uh, it was overwhelming after the Kickstarter was done. So in the future, I scaled back a little bit from that sort of thing, trying to customize projects so much, um, you know, looking for those ex that extra funding dollars. Um, the other thing that I learned was, um, you know, as soon as the Kickstarter was done, it was successful. A German partner wanted to get on board and do a German version. We decided to do a box together. And like many Kickstarter projects, that one ended up taking way longer than I expected because I had this other partner on board that had uh, specifications and it ended up being delivered about six, seven months later than it was supposed to, which at the time for me was horrible because I've been, you know, as a publisher, a game publisher, pretty much everything I have, I, you know, I know exactly when things are going to come out. And there's like shipping delays and various delays that happen. But this was really frustrating because we had all these people, and at the time, it was only a couple hundred, which now doesn't seem like a big deal. But then it was, uh, and actually have something come out that much later was really frustrating. Um, so uh, one of the things that I've done since then is um, definitely pre-managed everything so I know exactly what's going to happen. And you know, as many good suggestions as you get from backers and, and things you want to do during the campaign, you got to stick to what you started with in terms of this is exactly what I'm going to deliver and when. And if you have a plan for that and you've already done the math and figured out the shipping times and costs, um, you should be in pretty good shape ahead of time. Very true and sage advice for your manager campaign. Let me just sort of ask you as someone, I mean, you've backed, you not only have you done eight, eight projects, but you've backed a significant amount, I think 149 projects so far. What is it about the community not necessarily just on Kickstarter, but the crowdfunding community in general that has facilitated 
uh, the game space so well? Why did why is it such a success story within the crowdfunding community? Well, I think part of it is um, you know, traditionally traditional publishers and and even myself as a publisher, it's tough for a designer to get in to get the attention of a publisher to have that publisher commit to developing their game and putting all the resources behind it to publish it, even if they think it's a good game. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to fit their line. It's it's the right timing. All sorts of things can happen. Um, and so the ability for Kickstarter to actually just take some designer who has a great idea and who's developed it enough that it's a sellable, playable game and put it up and make it available is awesome. And, you know, there's certainly been some great success stories um, around that from, you know, new designers want to get something out there. And I think the Kickstarter community over the last several years has become a little wiser in terms of what they're going to back and what they're not. Um, it's not just about fancy artwork. There's actually got to be some content there. Um, you know, if you're a new designer, a lot of backers will they'll demand rules. They'll demand rules. They'll demand a video gameplay. They'll demand something to really get them a feel for what that game is. And that should be done anyway. I think as far as a, if you're a designer or a publisher, because you really want your customers to understand what it is they're getting into. You don't want them to get it and be upset with it and frustrated because they're probably not going to come back to you and buy something else in the future or back another project of yours if they don't like it. Um, so I think over time, the you know there's still a whole lot of crap out there, and there's still a lot of people who go, hey, Kickstarter, I can make a lot of money if I just put something together and call it a game and and put it out there. But the ones that are successful, um, and certainly the ones that you'll see, you know, that do game after game after game, they've taken the time to to really educate their backers about what it is they're offering, and then deliver within a reasonable amount of time, even if they don't actually hit their expected dates. Speaking of educating backers, you put a section in your campaign breakdown that I haven't really seen a lot before uh, called your responsibilities as a backer. And I think um, the idea of crowdfunding is still fairly new. I mean, it, it's, it's becoming more established, but people aren't, people that back projects don't necessarily know what they are getting involved with. It's not the same as buying in a store, obviously. Um, and I just kind of want to read these because I think they're really interesting. And I'll ask you, you know, why did you decide to write this on your page? One of the responsibilities is to read all of the updates. The second is to do the math so that people pay the appropriate amount of money uh, for the, the reward level that they're seeking. Uh, you ask that they fill out their surveys right away and accurately, uh, engage, and then tell other people about the campaign. What was your thinking in sort of outlining for the uh, for the community of backers, what they need to do as part of your campaign. So you know, I think anyone who's familiar with Kickstarter, you know, who's backed a lot of projects or has you know kind of watched in the sidelines some projects go through, a lot of those things seem like common sense to them. I think for the most part, um, but uh, you know, it's been my experience that we get, I would say, anywhere between ten and twenty five percent brand new backers, people who have never used Kickstarter before. Um, you know, most of our games tend to be the kind of entry level types of games that that people who aren't really gamers are excited about, and they go, "Oh, that looks really cool! I'll I'll get this." And then they're like, "Oh, Kickstarter, that's new to me," and they don't quite understand how it works. And so, you know, I try not to be too verbose on the page in terms of instructions and what to do, but at the same time, uh, you know, there's a bunch of things that people just don't seem to necessarily be aware of, and things we run into. And I think that you know, things like um, do the math. Seems really obvious, um, but some people will look and they'll go, "Oh, um, you know, I went this level, and I, I went two of these levels, and well, it's two times that amount. Put that amount down in your your backing. Don't put less or more because it's confusing for us when we get it. We have to verify with them, and it's also, you know, put, has potential to delay things. Um, you know, it's it's just one of those things that I would say that maybe five percent of the um, responses that we get back on surveys aren't filled out correctly. Um, you know, and it seems ridiculously high, but um, certainly outside of the country, people who have English as a second language, they may not put the right things in the right fields. Um, and, uh, you know, it looks like they're filling things out very quickly. Um, and that causes all sorts of problems for us. And of course, uh, even worse for the backer because they may not get their package or they may not get what they wanted. So I, I think a lot of this stuff is, hey, hopefully they read this. You know, I know from just look at the comments, you know, there's a ton of comments already, and people asking questions that were answered in the bulk of the campaign. But that's to be expected. You know, not everyone's going to read everything. Uh, I just try to get the key stuff down there, the responsibilities part about filling out the survey, putting the right information, doing their math right, you know, tell their friends, which is something every Kickstarter, um, you know, creator harps on anyway. Might as well put it there because, uh, you know, I try not to say it too much. 
but that's how the product projects are successful. If they don't tell their friends, there can be a very limited scope of people. I can only market, you know, to X number of people and still have a successful Kickstarter campaign. So a lot of it is dependent on the backers themselves telling other people. And uh, whenever I see a tweet or a Facebook post that I know has a wide audience, that's always a, a great feeling. Like, yeah, someone actually took that to heart, and you know, now we've expanded the scope of where I, you know, places I just couldn't reach before. That's great. And I think the other sort of interesting thing about the way you structure your campaign and as a successful game creator, you've been doing this for a long time. You acknowledge straight out that the Kickstarter campaign ultimately kind of dictates whether or not the game is made, which I think is, um, isn't is common for a lot of projects, I think, for people just starting. Uh, will you just sort of reiterate what's there on the page in terms of why Kickstarter for someone that has uh, already proven they can do this, that has the funding and, and wherewithal and ability to go out and make this game anyway. Um, yeah. I think there are obviously good reasons for doing that, but you know, sure. tell us why you did it. Yeah, um, you know, I think there's a number of reasons. On a on a selfish for the business level, it's certainly it's great marketing. Having a campaign that's successful means that hey, there's there's definitely interest in that game. Um, you know, and, and it's it's sort of free marketing. I mean, the amount of work that goes into a Kickstarter campaign, as you probably know, is immense. It's it's not uh, it's it's not. You know, something for nothing. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, so that's that's one thing that's nice is the, the marketing aspect. But but really, it's a way for you know, it's you know, as a publisher, even though we're a very small company, we don't get to interact with people directly on a regular basis. There's forums on various sites and you know, uh, Twitter and that sort of thing. But this is one way to really kind of engage with the community, uh, people who are actually buying the games or have bought in the past, in a way for them to ask questions and to. Um, add suggestions, and that's really kind of cool. And it's it's refreshing for me to hear that sort of thing um, in, in that, that kind of an online forum. So that's one thing. The other thing is, um, you know, offering them something special. You know, as a Kickstarter backer, they're they're basically helping to fund um, more things for this game. And this particular game has a free app with it. And that, of course, it's not really free. We have to pay for the development of it and all the work that goes into getting that app uh, out there and on the different platforms that, it, that it's on. And so it's a way for us to actually, you know, okay, the, the more that we get, you know, contribute to this Kickstarter, we're going to use some of those funds and put them directly into app development to make the experience even better for everyone. And that's kind of neat. Uh, the, the another thing is, is really giving them something back, something special for being part of the Kickstarter. Um, they're getting two things with this Kickstarter, which uh, I don't know if anyone else is doing this. We're actually air shipping every single copy of the game from the manufacturing uh, in China to the US where we're going to ship it out then you know to individuals. Um, so instead of waiting for a boat to come across, which has of course all sorts of delays um, put into that, you know, we're basically taking the hit, which is kind of expensive, it's pretty expensive, to get everything air shipped across, especially when you're you know air shipping thousands of copies. And uh, but everyone's going to get everything right away. So they're going to get their games um, theoretically in October, maybe even sooner. I mean who knows? It uh, depends on how quickly the, the printer can turn things around at the end of the campaign when I press the button and say, yes, print this many. Um, they airship them over. They're going to get them in October, whereas people who buy the game in stores won't get it until January, probably. So because that's on the slow boat that slowly makes its way over and um, you know gets go through all the distribution channels it has to. So uh, that's really nice. And uh, one of the things I like it as a creator is I have much better control over what's happening and being able to schedule the actual fulfillment, whether I use a fulfillment center, do it myself, et cetera, because I know when I'll be getting the product. When you ship something in, um, you know, shipping is notoriously horrible. When it's across the ocean, it's even worse because not only does it take time for the boat to get across the water, but it sits in customs for a long time, possibly. Um, it may sit at the dock for a long time before it gets offloaded. There's all sorts of things that can happen that's to delay the process. And you're never quite sure if it's gonna be when it's expected or even three or four weeks later. And I've run into those experiences before, and I still run into those with regular shipments. But for this one, being air shipped, even if Customs holds it, that's that's really minimum because uh, it's going to be it's it's going to be flown here, uh, which is you know within a day. So within three days, I usually have a really good estimate of when I'm going to actually have the product here to be able to start sending it out. Cool. Well, let me sort of wrap this up with uh, a twofold question. Uh, First, you're, again, I think you're unique in that you've done so many of these and have continually built success of each campaign uh, for the most part. So I wanted to ask, how do these campaigns, 
they, they're clearly part of your bigger business crowdfunding uh, play into the other parts of your business where you're direct selling or selling to retailers um, you know how does it amplify what you're already doing there um, and then secondly if you just want to share uh, one thought one key to your success for these campaigns what would that have been uh, for other people that are interested in starting their own okay so the first thing I mean how does it fit into the business well um, you know we we don't we haven't um, since Mutant Meeples. We really haven't done a big box campaign. We probably won't because um, they're really expensive. Uh, the the games are really expensive. The doing stretch goals for those sorts of things doesn't seem to make as much sense. And doing doing it this way uh, with the smaller games, just the social de deduction aspect is just innately viral anyway. And uh, it's just it fits really well. It's you know, if, if you have to pick, if you look at all our products, which ones would you do on Kickstarter or on a social platform? The One Night Ultimate Werewolf series or the Werewolf series was really kind of the one that would make sense um, for that. Um, you know, and the nice thing about that, we have a track record of these games doing really, really well in retail, regardless of their success on Kickstarter. So retailers aren't going to be scared off by, oh, well, they sold 3,000 copies already on Kickstarter. We don't want to carry that game. Um, so it actually, for us, it's actually the opposite. Well, well they've sold 3,000 on Kickstarter, and look how I many they've sold. We, you know, we've sold, by the end of this year, we'll have sold more than 100,000 copies of One Night Ultimate Werewolf, which is huge in board game terms. Um, and that's that's fantastic for us, and the retailers are very excited about that too. And we're just getting out there and promoting the name of the game and the series even more through Kickstarter. So that's how it fits into the overall business. Um, in terms of you know what things we've done to you know ensure it's being successful or that you know other people can take away from it, for me it's preparedness. Um, you know I've I've gone through and prepared every single thing of this campaign. Um, you know I have a spreadsheet with multiple tabs that has uh, shipping costs and that that basically has you know every day I go through and I update it based on where we are sales uh, relative to the previous campaigns, so I get a much better feel about where we're going to end up. And so I can start working with my manufacturer and I can work with my shipping partners to um, make sure that we're going to have everything in place to, ready to go when I said it's going to be ready. And again, just a lot of preparation ahead of time. Um, and I started working on this campaign probably about six months ago. Um, so you know, the more you can do to be ready to go, um, it makes this period much less stressful. I can engage with uh, the, the backers online in comments and provide updates and even the updates, for the most part, there's there's certain aspects that I know we're going to go into those updates ahead of time, so they don't have to be kind of written on the spot. And all of that really helps, I think, make the campaign feels a lot more professional to the people who are backing it. Um, they're going to look at this and go, wow, that was run really well, and it causes a lot less stress on my end. Um, and uh, you know, it's really hard to do for a new time um, Kickstarter creator. They're going to go ahead and uh, try and do as much of that as they can too. But you never know how successful it's going to be, and and certainly even with something like this, this is I'm blown away by how many people have backed this already. This is fantastic, and it is definitely beyond my predictions. So I'm I'm thrilled with that. But you just don't know because something might come out suddenly. Maybe vampires just have I don't know. Maybe there was an actual vampire attack someplace, and people are like, no, that's not. We shouldn't make that a game. Um, and then no way to lie. I don't know. Um, you know, um, whatever it could possibly be that might might hurt it, you just don't know. So. Uh, trying to prepare for all the contingencies and just be as prepared as possible is really, I think, what helps make you successful. Amen. Preparation is uh, is definitely something that we see a lot in terms of whether or not campaigns succeed. Uh, even the best prepared people sometimes fail, but uh, you are currently killing it. Again, thank you, Ted, for joining us. For anyone interested, One Night Ultimate Vampire uh, still has a, quite a bit of ways to go. Uh, on Kickstarter, they're already funded, so uh, you'll definitely be getting your game, it sounds like, in the beginning for everyone else, and it looks like a very uh, fun and engaging board game. So, Ted, thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right, we'll see you next week.